Hello everybody and welcome back to Profiling Evil today. I'm on a solemn mission in the northwest Utah desert with Dylan Round's mother, Candace Cooley. We're here in search of the location where convicted killer James Brenner buried Dylan, a young man who tragically was murdered two years ago. Our goal is to uncover and then respectfully continue to excavate his grave hoping to find more of his remains. And then we're going to fill this thing in to protect it and disguise it from future desecration. Well, welcome to Profiling Evil in this special edition on Dylan Rounds where we visit the location that James Brenner disposed of his body. This happened after he murdered him two years ago. Now I'm here with Candace Cooley, Dylan's mother, and we've invited Jason Jensen, a private investigator and a friend, to join us on this mission. He has a cadaver dog that we're going to put to work. So I hope you'll take a moment and hit that like and subscribe button and share this video with your friends. Well, I'll tell you, it's 105 degrees outside, and uh, we're going to be doing some digging and working, some heavy-duty yard work. I've come prepared, though, with a shovel, a rake, and a pick, and I've come prepared with my drone, a DJI Mini 4 Pro. Now, these, now these tools are going to help us cover more ground and then carefully excavate any area that we find that's of interest. Our plan is to geographically record the area so that I can return in about four months, refly the area, and then share with remote desert investigators how the changing landscape really does evolve. It's going to be kind of a swipe map of before and after. Dylan Rounds was a young farmer from Idaho who gained global attention due to his mysterious disappearance. He was only 19 years old at the time, vanishing in late May of 2022, two years and three, four months now. He was doing so while working on his farm in Lucen, Utah, and his parents immediately knew that Dylan simply didn't walk away, and it would take local law enforcement a few days at least to elevate his disappearance to suspicious and ultimately to homicide. Now, his disappearance sparked widespread searches and significant media coverage. And if you go back to one of my earlier videos on the case, I actually came out and drove the area extensively to help you and other viewers better understand what a needle in the haystack this case truly is. You can find that video by going to the Profiling Evil playlist, and I think you'll find it to be really inter interesting. But throughout the entire police investigation, I was privileged to communicate regularly with Dylan's family. Because of that, I didn't speculate on the suspects in the case, nor did I have any of the family join me on the few videos that I actually did. But now that the criminal case is behind us, I can talk a lot more freely about it. Back then, I simply knew too much, and I didn't want to risk exposing anything that had been shared to me in confidence. It took about a year after Dylan's disappearance before investigators charged James Brenner with murder. Almost immediately, this guy began negotiating with prosecutors. This was happening through his defense attorneys, obviously. <clears throat> now, Brenner was willing to tell where B Dylan was buried, but he wanted an outrageous deal. Uh, I'm not sure if the prosecutors were actually considering it or if they were hoping Dylan's parents might consider it, but they were going to have nothing about it. They wanted nothing to do with anything that would allow this guy to get out of prison at some point in his life. So the investigation continued, and they looked for this kid day and night and kept hoping that they might somehow recover his body and get enough evidence to put Brenner away for life. Brenner remained in jail on federal gun charges, not even charged officially with the murder where he held a preliminary hearing. But despite extensive efforts by law enforcement, search teams, and volunteers, Dylan Rounds' remains were never found. 
in April of this year, everything changed. Candace was in, in uh, Arizona, I believe, and she reached out to me to let me know that investigators had just alerted her that they had recovered Dylan, accompanied by Brenner, who told them what happened. You'll remember my short video indicating that Dylan had been recovered and me mentioning the fact that Candace had authorized me to talk about it. I think many of you also know that I'm very close with Candace Cooley and the Dylan Rounds family. And I want to just announce that Dylan's body has been recovered. Now, it's too early to share any of the details about this. And bits and pieces will come out through authoritative sources at the appropriate time. But the good news is that Dylan Rounds has been recovered. His body has been returned home, and after it's processed, law enforcement will turn it over to the family. But for those of you who might not be familiar with the area that we're talking about, I want to just step back for a moment and go to a map. We'll look at the map for a couple of minutes and try to give you a sense of the area in totality. So to geographically put all of this into perspective, let's go to this map and kind of regroup in the area that we're talking about. We're here in the United States and in the northwest corner of Utah, so right near the Idaho and Nevada border. If we zoom into that area, what I've done is created a map to kind of show you visually the area we're talking about. The Salt Lake Valley is here on the right. You can see the Wasatch Mountain Range running north and south right along here. And then this brown line that I've got indicating on the, the map shows the route to travel from my home in the Salt Lake City area out to Lucent. It's about two and a half hours, whether you go wet, um, south and then west of the Great Salt Lake across the Salt Flats, which you might remember from all the speed racing in the uh, late 50s and 60s, uh, and then northbound up into the Lucent area, or if you go around to the north, just hugging the Idaho border to the north and then making your way down into Lucen. There are two points of interest that I want to just point out on this map as we zoom in. <clears throat> the first is the location of Dillon's Farm, which is this square box on the right-hand side or the eastern side of the Lucen Valley area. And if we zoom in, we can kind of get an image of that crop circle where Dillon was starting to farm and this is from satellite imagery that I had some, uh, from some of my friends over at Black Sky who uh, uh, donated a flyover for me in order to understand this. Then, of course, we're putting this onto Esri software. So you can see the collection of that Black Sky imagery here. And then the location where Dylan was murdered, which is a ranch in which uh, Brenner was squatting and Dylan uh, would keep his one of his grain trucks uh, to keep it out of, of the rain. There we go. So you can see that uh, grain bin. And then, of course, there are, I've removed a bunch, but there are a bunch of pieces of equipment out there in addition to that. From there, what we needed to do is try to figure out where Dylan was buried. And keep in mind, I mean, this is literally uh, thousands of square miles of space. In fact, if we were to just measure this area uh, in this uh, view that we're looking at, just going from the highway out past Dillon's farm and back is 64 square miles of area that needed to be searched if you were going to just try to encapsulate this into a small area. So again, as we look at this aerial imagery as I fly the drone over, it gives you a sense of how incredibly vast this area is and how difficult trying to find something there would be, especially something that had been concealed in the ground like a remote grave, which is what we were looking for. We wanted to go out and go to the place in which Brenner buried him. Now in this photograph I'm showing, you can see the actual way in which Brenner drove a small uh, backhoe into the side of a little bit of a mountain and pulled enough dirt out that he could dispose of Dylan's body and then he just dumped the dirt over it. Like most disorganized criminals, 
He simply wanted to get rid of the problem and uh, was shoving this kid into the ground. Now that, in uh, comparison to after law enforcement uh, removed Dylan's remains, and then Candace and her family went out and dug deeper and discovered more of Dylan's remains, we decided to return and fill in this grave and do one last excavation of the site. Lucen, Utah is a remote, to say the least, and challenging area to navigate. But with the help of my drone, we can efficiently scan the landscape for any signs of Dylan's grave. Now this mission was more about respect and closure, even though everyone hates that word. And it was mostly about protecting Dylan's memory. So let's get the drone up in the air and survey the land so that you can get a sense of this from the drone's image. We're looking for any disturbed earth or signs that might indicate a burial site. Now again, this is going to give you a way to look through the drone's eye, allowing us to cover these huge areas of ground and quickly pinpoint spots that we believe need closer inspection. We know exactly where the grave is, but there were other things that might lend to this, like tire tracks or tire tracks coming from the shed and moving over. Any suspicious locations would be marked for further investigation. Now, I got there a couple of hours before Candace did, and I settled into collecting images of the area with my drone. In totality, I collected more than a thousand high-resolution images using my DJI Mini 4 Pro drone. I flew the area at an elevation of about 200 feet, in fact, 200 exactly, and I flew it in a cross-hatch pattern, setting up the camera at about a 75% angle to assist in gathering three-dimensional images. Then I reflew the area at 100 feet. Now, I'm telling you this because... There are some of my uh, drone geek friend pilots that are out there watching this, and they might wish to replicate this process in things they're doing or for investigators in their own criminal investigations. Then I took to processing the imagery using Esri's ArcGIS drone to map. And, and as I processed those, I turned it into a two-dimensional and a three-dimensional map. And this is just a perfect time to thank my former employee Esri, Environmental Systems Research Institute, for providing us here at Profiling Evil with the ArcGIS platform. It is the mechanism that drives our mapping at Profiling Evil, including those cool story maps that you find on our website. So make sure you check them out. Now Dylan's grave was located near the shed where many believed he was murdered. And if you remember, we went out a few months ago and took some imagery of the the camper that um, James Brenner was squatting in and the area. So as we look at this imagery, I want you to kind of put all this into your mind, thinking back on the map that we just talked about and the location of Dylan's farm versus the location of this area where the shed is and where Brenner was squatting. And then uh, where I'm, I'm not going to tell you is where the grave actually was. But using this aerial imagery, we could start to understand, especially if this were done early on, where there might be tracks across the sagebrush and across the open country, or places that we might not have thought about inspecting. And this is what's so important about looking at these things from an aerial perspective, but we can't rely on aerial perspectives alone. Well, then we got down to looking at the grave, and after several hours of painstaking digging, and sifting, we were fortunate enough to find more of Dylan's remains. Now, I'm not going to show any of that in case it ever needs to become evidence or for some other uh, authorized purpose. But Candace will actually speak about it at the end of the video when we recap our day. But for the true crime enthusiasts who wonder how the watch is built, I thought I'd briefly talk about all these steps that are taken in looking for clandestine or hidden graves in the desert. Now this is going to be a really high overview, but it gives you an idea of some of the things I took into consideration before going out to help Candace. Searching for a clandestine grave in a desert is incredibly complex, and it's a sensitive task. It requires careful planning, 
coordination and execution of the plan. So here are kind of the general steps that I took with the idea that if this were the first time you were searching, you'd do it on a whole lot bigger scale. Most important part of this preparation and planning stage is bringing a team of experts together that includes people like forensic anthropologists, archaeologists, uh, crime scene investigators, uh, search and rescue personnel. All of these kinds of folks are enlisted into this thing. This formal process already had uh, happened. So our purpose today was not as much about recovering more evidence. Remember, this case has been adjudicated and, and the killer is now in prison as a convicted murderer. But this thing today is more about finding additional remains of Dylan and then disguising his grave so that it can't be visited by curious onlookers. Now, he'll have an official grave up in Idaho that you can visit if you ever want to visit him. As part of the preparation and planning process, Candace thought it might be helpful to also provide some training for a new cadaver dog. And that cadaver dog's handler is a guy named Jason Jensen, a private investigator out of Salt Lake City. Good friend. I was thrilled to be able to work with Jason. And the cadaver dog did search the area. Again, think about this, 105 degrees. Now, in normal cases, before conducting a site evaluation, there's a great deal of intelligence gathering that goes on by investigators. The witnesses need to be interviewed. Historical data needs to be collected. And, of course, geographic data, including satellite imagery. These kinds of things can provide some really cool tips on where you should search. You can't discount the use of drones or aircrafts to conduct aerial surveys of huge areas. It can be really helpful, but you got to keep in mind, again, we're looking for a body. This is a needle in a proverbial haystack. Even our friends, the Diesel Brothers, came out in their helicopter and helped search the, other, the area. Other people with drones and planes, ATVs, scoured the landscape. Everybody was looking for disturbed soil, vegetation anomalies, or unusual patterns that might indicate a burial site. Now, this imagery from my drone should serve, again, as a visual education on how difficult searching from air really can be. Law enforcement and, of course, the Cooley Rounds family walked the area extensively. Again, do I even need to say it? A needle in a haystack. You know, in some searches, my buddy Greg Cooper and I conducted one in, one in San Antonio, Texas. It was part of a documentary we were working on for A&E on serial killers called The Killing Grounds. We used ground penetrating radar to, to help us discover bones that had been buried underground. It helps you detect subsurface anomalies. It's a non-invasive method that can really help you look into disturbed soil or voids, cavities, but it isn't something that was required on this visit, just in case some of you uh, come up with that idea. Now, in more complex and highly sensitive searches, think, think about uh, the space shuttle Columbia that crashed in debris field was across the desert. Experts can rely on other kinds of scientific equipment like magnetometry or electrical resistivity or thermal imaging to complement the ground penetrating radar data. But again, not necessary in this case. In our case, Brenner had revealed the location where he buried Dylan. So no reconnaissance or ge geophysical surveys were required in this thing. We didn't even have to do non-invasive tests or be concerned about setting up grid systems to ensure that the evidence was systematically searched and uh, extracted. In pristine investigations, though, investigators would remove the soil thin layers at a time to avoid damaging any potential evidence. And then they would carefully sift the dirt away from the debris, much like a, a gold panner looking for nuggets as they wash the water through the soil. We did want to photograph and map the excavation site, though, and we found of particular interest that it would be to study how the location changed over time. Think about it. Dylan was in the earth, exposed to the elements of weather for two years. 
I really wanted to know how the landscape could change in that time frame and how it would change going forward. So for this purpose, we collected all that imagery. Remember, more than a thousand high resolution images. Now in an ongoing investigation, the crime scene personnel would carefully collect any human remains, personal effects, or other evidence and package it up, label it, and get it ready for forensic analysis. The recovered evidence would then be transported to a forensic laboratory for detailed anal analysis and then uh, prepared. So they'd be looking for things like DNA and other kinds of things before preparing a comprehensive report to help in the investigation. Well, after we completed our thorough examination of the clandestine grave, we decided that we needed to fill the grave in and smooth the area out. Maybe even cover some sagebrush over it, replant some sagebrush to further disguise it. It was really humbling to be there. Well, hey folks, I'm here with Candace and we're uh, out in the West Desert at an undisclosed location. <laughs> and uh, it's going to remain undisclosed, yes. but... Uh, We've been out uh, flying the drone, we've been getting some imagery, and we've been uh, digging around in Dylan's grave a little bit, and you've already discovered something. Maybe you can point it out and we'll uh, let you yeah, talk about so it. Yeah, so we dug this up a couple months ago and found some bone, and then we found another piece of a tibia bone today. Yeah, Candace, I can't imagine how difficult, even with the fact that you're pretty pragmatic, it's... Uh, it's still pretty dang troubling. Yeah. And I think the thing that's really kind of troubling me is that not much of the grave was excavated. So we're going to spend some time and uh, dig up even more of it today. Uh, we also have a cadaver dog coming out. We're just going to see if we can find any more of them and then we can put this chapter to bed. It's eerie thinking he was right here. After we covered and disguised the grave, I flew over the area again with the drone to show some of the before and after imagery. And this is all gonna be compared with another flyover that I'm gonna conduct in about four months, giving us a little bit of a timeline of history and a way to scientifically examine the change that's gone on out there. Well, before we drove away and said our goodbyes, we met next to the Lucen Pond the location where Dylan's mobile phone was recovered. Now, if you remember that part of the investigation, that mobile phone had imagery that was taken, snapshots of a bloody James Brenner cleaning the rifle that he used to execute Dylan Rounds. Well, hey everybody, it's Mike from Profiling Evil. I'm here with uh, Jason Jensen. You know him from uh, appearances with me on Court TV. Of course, he does a lot of them on his own. But uh, that's how we became friends is through Court TV. And of course, we're here with Candace Cooley, the mother of Dylan Rounds. And Candace, um, I thought it would just be kind of interesting. We've had a pretty eventful day. Yeah. <laughs> it is, uh, it's a day that's gonna be about 105 in the Northwest uh, Utah desert. So we are uh, luckily in the shade. But why don't you share with everybody where we are, what's so significant about this location and why you wanted Jason and me to meet you out here today. Um, so we're at the Lucent Pond, and I don't know if this location is significant, but it's a good meeting spot. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Jason and Mike came out and helped us today. We wanted to uh, go through the grave site one more time, see if we could find something, and we did um, give Jason's dog Lily a chance to experience and give her some training and see if she could find anything, and just kind of put some closure I hate that word but at least to the Lucen area you know I think something really important just came out Jason that I want to capitalize on and that is uh, Candace is not only a pretty remarkable person and a bulldog if that's a <laughs> fair term when it comes to protecting her son and making sure this case is heard but she brought out something about why you ended up bringing out a dog that you've been training to be a cadaver dog and part of her mission in keeping Dylan's legacy alive. What are your thoughts about that? Oh, I think it's amazing that she really wants to give back to the community, the search community, help and other canine teams to get their experience. I think she's planning on some donations to canine teams. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
you know, any chance that a canine has to learn human remains detection is a good opportunity because it takes that experience to build on their, their knowledge and skill set to make them more effective in the future. So we appreciate that and uh, we're, we're planning to donate to your foundation for Dale and Rounds as well, uh, given the fact that you've given us this opportunity. Yeah. Appreciate that. Yeah, I'm glad you guys came out. And another big thing we got done today is we buttoned it up, we filled in the grave. You know, that was really, it's kind of a, you're working so hard and we, uh, we not only excavated the grave a little deeper, and it was interesting how interested the dog was as we dug in the area. You talked about the fact that the decomposition smell was terrible a few months ago when you were mm -hmm. here at first uh, digging up uh, Dylan's remains. Uh, that seems evident that it's still here. And, uh, um, but we, we then had the chance to, to kind of make this a little more hallowed and get it closed off where it's not as noticeable. Right. And I was a little frustrated that law enforcement didn't close that hole in a little bit. I, and, yeah. and again, you know, I love law enforcement. I spent a career in it. Um, but I also think about victims and the survivors of victims and the little things that really make a big difference. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, you know, we shouldn't have had to be digging in the grave anyways, and it was never excavated in the beginning. Um, we did that. Everything you've seen that was dug out today, that was all us. Um, so not only did they not look further because they had enough for an ID, they were just going to leave it that way. Just yeah. total lack of respect and empathy. They're just, it's still just mind boggling. You know, Jason, we talk a lot on court TV about victims, victims rights, the advocacy process, and um, just this uh, act today of closing up this grave and smoothing it out so that others can't come along and glump across it. Mm -hmm. what, what are your thoughts as you think about just that, the chance we've had, I mean, that's pretty unique to be invited to come and do that. Right, right, I, I felt honored to be out here and help you seal up the, you know, the remnants of the clandestine grave, because I wouldn't expect that to be. When we showed up and you guys were there and there's a hole there, I didn't think that was a natural thing to walk up to. I right. thought we were gonna have a, <laughs> closed off ground and everything that was there as part of the crime scene would mm -hmm. be almost reminiscent. There would be no evidence of it, but with there being a hole there, it was evident that's where they found yeah. your son and they left it in that condition. Yeah, yep, they absolutely did. We were all filling up the hole, except for this one, kept trying to <laughs> unfill it. <laughs> yeah, that dog's a problem, right? I'll talk to you later about that. But, um, you know, the other thing that I thought was interesting is, um, the fact that we uncovered a shin bone. Yep. Uh, you have recovered Dylan's hair here, mm -hmm. other bone fragments that will be used for training. But again, um, it, it just kind of it kind of bothers me that we don't look a little deeper. We're getting really good about the victim advocacy process. We had victim advocates in court, and they were there for you throughout yes. that whole process. It's just like there's little ends that are getting forgotten that really yeah. are meaningful to families. Well, and I think, and I've talked with the victims advocates we've dealt with, um, there's a very lapse in our system. So this victim advocate specializes in this. And then as we came to a closure with Dylan and Brandon Merrill reached out to me, we find out we're entitled to X amount of money to pay for Dylan's funeral costs, all kinds of stuff that we've never been told. Oh, that's surprising. So there's a huge lapse of, of what each victim advocate is offering a family. There's no real guideline. It's it's really not a good system. Well, so um, hopefully you're, you're, if you need to be, I'll connect you to the Victims' Rights Advocacy Group. Um, when I was in the county attorney's office, we actually st established one of the first victims' rights groups in the state of Utah. That's 34 years ago. So we ought to be a lot further developed right, than we are yeah. as far as the notification process. Um, but we continue to work with them. In fact, Profiling Evil donated to them just recently uh, to help get training for law enforcement in sex assault cases. But uh, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the area. Now the pond is really significant from an evidentiary standpoint. Right. You want to cover any of that? Now we're in yeah. kind of a position we can talk about anything yeah. you want. Right? Yeah, so Dylan's phone was recovered just right back here behind us. Um, it was followed through the RTT data down the road. 
and ultimately that's what led to the conviction was the phone and it was pulled out of this pond and 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 that kid had the insight to set that phone on kind no, of how no. did that phone so get Dylan captured? Dylan had an iPhone 8 that's all he would use and when the old iPhone software is out you'd pull your phone out of your back pocket and it had taken 50 pictures or it was videoing or right it'd do that all the time mine still does it my granddaughter does not know my password well she's only four but she can still make my phone video without unlocking it. So it was just, when Brenner picked up Dylan's phone, it was just the right swipe, the perfect, every star oh. was in alignment. And because the video, you can, like, the beginning of the first few seconds, you can tell it's like in a pocket or he's walking with it. And then it's laid down on the camper and it's videoing, but he doesn't know it as he starts to wipe the blood off of him. It had nothing to do with Dylan. So that is really intriguing. I don't know if you were aware of that, Jason. I was I, this always, is all news to me. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I was know. under the impression yeah. that he actually put the, the, no. the uh, time lapse or something on. No. So you try to convince me that there is not a loving God who makes sure that in this particular case, <laughs> something happened. And thankfully, that guy was yeah. a dumb enough guy technologically yeah. that he not, didn't even catch up. Well, on. and he didn't think about it. He packed the phone around with him. He, he didn't realize he was being tracked everywhere he went with that phone. He didn't think that was a possibility. That's not something that he knew. So he was shocked. He was, you know, the agents have told us when they showed him that video, he was absolutely just mind boggled. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it was, and there's been a lot of questions about how that video, you know, came about and people say all the time, Dylan knew he was gonna be murdered. And I'm like, if he knew, he wouldn't have been there. Yeah, you 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 <laughs> yeah, get away. Yeah, yeah, that you would be your that. whole point is yes. okay, I gotta break away, I gotta get some distance. Yeah, I need to step away from this person. Um so yeah, it was just the right way when and I, I would be willing to bet when he shot Dylan he had his phone in his hand. And he so it incredible. dropped and then he picked it up. That's incredible. You know, the other thing that I find interesting, of course, um again, thank you for inviting me to be with the family during the sentencing and the, the last hearing, uh, the previous hearing with Brenner, but I still am angry that he didn't have the guts or the courtesy to turn and look at the family. But one of the things from an evidentiary standpoint that has continued to trouble me is he's admitted to shooting Dylan, but he won't admit to executing him and finishing no him. and and you know that was never the Blair Wardle the one day in court um, said you know the two bullet holes to the head but that's never been they've never elaborated on that and if it wasn't for us seeing the physical x-ray of the bones they didn't tell us that they said he was shot in the head and that was it but it was you know 22 in the temple and out behind the ear and then the 45 directly on top of his head well, the only way you make that wound is if you're standing over somebody in the sitting position and shoot them directly on top of the head. Yeah, yeah. And I think the reason why Brenner will never say what happened is because that's an execution. So how do you still try to blame it on Dylan? Yeah. How, and, how, how at this, like, how could you even, there's no realistic view of, so right now he's still playing that it was Dylan's fault and wants the world to believe that. And if the real story ever came out, I mean, it's it's a lot more, it puts a lot more power to what he actually did. It's way more powerful when you say, you know, we shot our son execution. And then that makes the public matter because it's like, yet yeah, you might let this guy out in three days or three years. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a bold statement to say what he actually did to Dylan and all he got was three to 30 years. Well, and I, I guess the redeeming news is the judge knew all of that. Yes. And the judge didn't pull any punches. I mean, it was, yeah. you could sense the judge's anger. Yes. Uh, in that courtroom, couldn't yep. you? Yep. And, and for him to say, you know, he's already gave his recommendation to the pro board, that, that goes a long way. But the crime should be enough itself. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it really should be. There shouldn't even be an option. And, and to hear, you know, as attorney in court say, you know, my client held up his part of the bargain and he led him to Dylan and like he needed a pat on the back for that. You're the one who put him there. Yeah. You don't get kudos because you stuck her son in a hole after you shot him in the head twice. Yeah, that's no, terrible. no. And, and, you know, insult the injury, blame yeah. Dylan for yeah, blame his Dylan own death. For, that's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. But it's not uncommon, though. When I was doing self, I mean, when I was doing defense work, we would oftentimes hear where there'd be some kind of 
scuffle between two individuals and our accused would blame the other side and claims even, you know, feign it, contrary to the evidence, some kind of self-defense yeah. or defense of others. It, you know, it's clearly like as you described, an execution rather than you know, some kind of self-defense or, you know, there was a give yeah. and take, mutual combatants or something. So. Right. Yeah. Well, so uh, another thing that we did today that I think is going to be really interesting is we got some really nice drone imagery mm -hmm. at uh, multiple elevations so that we can create a three-dimensional map of the disposal site. Is That's the technical term right. or the place in which Dylan was uh, buried the second time, most likely, mm -hmm. I if he was ever buried the first time. Yeah. And that, you know, makes you wonder about the organizational level of Brenner. That first time he may have just dump Dylan somewhere and then thought later I got to do something and there was a lot of evidence that you talked about mm -hmm. that uh, pointed toward his attempts to confuse the investigation in that regard but uh, with that imagery we'll be able to look at some of the change detection and use that for other cold case investigations to look at terrain and see what you can learn from the terrain and and from the environment and of course this this is kind of a, a single little nook and cranny in the world, uh, much like uh, only one segment of the body farm in Tennessee where they put different body parts in different kinds of soil to manage and understand it. But at least for the desert, it gives Utah and um, Nevada and other states, California maybe, some really powerful information. Yeah. And uh, again, that's part of Dylan's legacy that that you have pushed for, and uh, um, we'll come back in three, four, six months, Probably and we'll see how the terrain how, has changed. Yeah, it'll be interesting, like when you were showing me on your footage when you were flying right over that hole, you could barely see it. Yeah. Everybody in searches thinks, get an airplane, get a helicopter, and drones are, there is software that's great, but in areas like this, it's hard to see from the air. It's yeah. And you, you were right on it, and we knew what we were looking at, and it was still hard to see. Right, and the reality is being a desert disposal, which is fairly common, you know, for us Utah natives, it, it, the fact that you got his body recovered is amazing all on its own. We hear story after story on cold cases where they, you know, dispose of a body likely in the desert. You know, one comes to mind, Susan Cox Powell and you know she's never been recovered right. and many others haven't been recovered so it's it's amazing that you do have that closure with him to to bury him properly yeah, because the desert yeah i mean the natural terrain the similarity of the landscape and color throughout you don't see that distinction that's too great to go oh there's a color difference right there for for a drone it's yeah. amazing that you can detect any subtleties like that, so. Yeah. I think that brings a really interesting way for us to kind of wrap up too, and that is that uh, we were gonna do this a couple of weeks ago, but finally <laughs> you were able to get Dylan's remains released. Why don't you yeah, talk yeah. a little bit about, um, because people will wanna know how to support a memorial and, and uh, yes. what, if anything, will be an actual permanent grave for Dylan? Uh, he'll be in the Iowa Falls area. For he, that's where his headstone and stuff will be. Um, he's actually back in Rigby now. We did get his remains moved. Um, we didn't really know what to do. We wanted Dylan to remain at the lab until we were confident we found we were done finding more of his remains because, you know, we don't have everything. Um, but we were never really guided. Um, luckily, our funeral home in Idaho is also licensed in Utah, so they were able to step in and but I mean, we had no communication. We had no, hey, are you guys ready to have Dylan released? We had it just, I mean, it's just, that is one consistent thing throughout the whole case and even coming to an end of it, it's still been that way. So I, I suspect people will wonder what becomes the grave that you visit? Because now you, you know, I talk about this a lot, Jason on Court TV and other places about this idea that in these crime scenes, we have multiple crime scenes. We have the place where the actual crime mm -hmm. occurred, and then you have disposal sites, and in this case, multiple disposal sites. But uh, what's the place that you go to? The cemetery. We got, we'll we build him a headstone. That's he, awesome. Yeah, he has a plot by his grandma and grandpa already. So That's great. Yep. And what happens out here in this wild desert where there's a little plot of ground that we've 
closed up today. It gets sold and we don't ever come back. That's awesome. That's awesome. I like I like uh, a pretty beautiful, uh, maintained, controlled environment park as a resting yeah. spot. Yeah. Not, not someplace out in the in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Where you could break down and right. something goes wrong down the road. Yeah. Well, um, Jason, thanks for coming out with us, and Candace, thank you. And yes, you thank know you how guys much for we coming. love you. It uh, it's been a really special. <laughs> ugly terrible journey but, right. but uh, <laughs> glad to be friends <laughs> it, it even is. under the worst circumstances right <laughs> it has so uh hey folks keep watching uh i think at some point uh there will be more coming from the dylan rounds legacy and so let's talk quickly talk about the website how people can donate and what you plan on doing because you're, you're helping a lot of families including next week yeah, so it's DylanRoundsLegacy.org. Um, we're actually holding a virtual memorial on his birthday this year for everyone. So you can go on there and get little sunflower uh, candles, and then we'll go live. I was actually going to ask if you wanted to come on with Missing in America Network for an hour and just let people share their pictures, share you know their thoughts about Dylan, and just kind of give the general public something to end with. Also, that'd be that'd be awesome. Uh, Jason, do you ever look at a sunflower the same after? Candace's campaign? No, no. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I went and visited your table at CrimeCon and got a couple of packets. I even had uh, uh, Brianne Sagers for Candace Har Harris ask me to get sunflower seeds from you. So it's <laughs> spreading around. Yeah, yeah, they're everywhere. <laughs> and, and I want you to know I brought a bouquet of sunflowers today. Uh, but we can't put them on the grave because we don't want anybody to know where the grave is. <laughs> so we held them there for a moment and Candace has taken them home. Yep, but, I'll uh, take them home. I got a place for them. <laughs> you got a, got a place. All right. Hey, thanks both yep. of you. Thank thanks. you. Honor Appreciate to be it. With you. Well, I'd really like your comments on this case, folks. I'd like your comments on the case, the work we've done behind the scenes, and your opinion of the value in researching change detection in the West Desert over time. I mean, does it really matter? And could it help investigators in the future? Please enter your comments down below and please share Profiling Evil with your friends. You know, the desert is unforgiving and it conceals many, many secrets. But with determination and respect, I hope to bring a little more peace to this story. Thanks so much for joining us on this important mission. And Candace Cooley and the Cooley Rounds family, thanks for trusting me with so many pieces of information along the way. Hey folks, if you've got any other information about Dylan Rounds' case, please reach out to the authorities. And please make sure you're keeping Dylan's memory alive by planting a few sunflowers. And make sure you're visiting and supporting DylanRoundsLegacy.org to learn more about the important work that Candace is doing to help other families who have gone through a similar nightmare as she. Hey, thanks for your support of Profiling Evil. Remember, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. And please check out our audio podcasts on your favorite podcast platform. And if you'd like to donate to our efforts at Profiling Evil, you can do so easily at profilingevil.com. There's a little donate link, and you can also sign up for our digital newsletter, the BOLO. That stands for Be On The Lookout. And while you're at the website, make sure you check out our blog, and this is really cool, our new Missing Persons and Unsolved Murders crowdsourced map. It's a place where you can weigh in on cases and add cases that haven't shown up in other venues. Please consider updating it with cases from your own community. It's easy to do and you'll see the link right on the website. Thanks again and we'll see you soon at the next crime scene.